2024 has been one of the best years for early access games so far. Enshrouded, No Rest for the Wicked, Pow World, Foundry, Manor Lords, Hades 2, and the game we're looking at in this video, The Rising. And as of today, May 8th, no longer shall it don the title of Early Access, because it is officially graduating to the big leagues with its new 1.0 update and full release. We're going to cover a lot of stuff about the game here, which is perfect if this is your first time hearing about it. But even if you've seen it before or played any of it in Early Access, the new 1.0 update is adding a lot of great features, new weapons, enemies, a new endgame location, and even more stuff you're going to want to stick around to hear about. Of course, this video would not be possible without Sunlock Studios, who is both a developer of E-Rising and the sponsor of today's video. And instead of doing a review on the game, because that doesn't really seem right with it being sponsored and all, I'm just going to present you with a very thorough overview of the game, and I'll let you guys be the judge of what you see in this video. That said, all of my thoughts in this video are straight from my own personal experience. All they asked me to do is tell you to check out the game on Steam with my link in the description, which you should do because the game is killing it right now with the reviews. And also, I gotta let you know that the game is coming to PS5 later this year. Alright, sound good? Now let's sink our teeth into this survival game and see what Stumlock Studios has been up to over the past two years. When you first load up VRising, you'll have the option of joining an online server, hosting your own private session for you and your friends, or setting up a dedicated server. The game features PvE and PvP exclusive modes, as well as a mixture of both, and these are things you can decide for your own server, along with a ton of individual settings for different survival mechanics, be it loot or enemies or PvP. You can also select one of three difficulty settings, with Brutal being a new difficulty in 1.0. I was playing on normal and it felt like a pretty good balance of things are difficult but I can reliably overcome them with some practice. In V Rising you play as a vampire or a vampirette? Is that even a thing? Hold on. Huh, the more you know. So you play as one of them and you've just woken up from a really short couple hundred year nap and you're extremely thirsty for blood, like you'll literally settle for anything you're so parched. You rush out the door, hopefully there's a juicy human to bite into. Nope. Nope, it's all skeletons. But it's okay because soon you'll find a bunch of probably disease infested rats to chew on, which is the second worst thing you could find, so off to a great start. Probably should have just stayed in the coffin to be honest. Now you're at the gates to the Far Bane Woods, and from here you can set forth into the wilderness, learn how to craft some basic tools and gear, and become familiar with the enemies and oh god, why is my skin burning? Uh, yeah, that's called the sun. That daylight thing kind of tends to happen after night. And as soon as that sun rises, you are forced to patrol the lands of Ardoran through the shadows cast by trees, rocks, and other tall structures. The main quest does a good job of keeping you smoothly on track and progressing to the next important milestone, though occasionally it does require you to figure some things out for yourself along the way. One of your earliest objectives is to build a castle heart and claim the territory where you want to build your future base. The world is not procedurally generated, and so you'll find designated plots of land around the map where you can build your castle. You can have up to two castles per person and they can be relocated later. Toss up some walls and a mist brazier to keep your base covered in shadow and now you've got yourself a humble beginning to what can be a gigantic, sprawling mansion. You've now got the perfect space to build machines like a workbench, a sawmill, a grinder, and a furnace, as well as more interesting tools like the research desk which lets you discover new consumables, new rings, and armor, and other useful items. Before you can really craft much of anything though, you'll need to do some harvesting, exploring, and of course, brace yourself for some combat, which in my opinion is the highlight of V-Rising and how it sets itself apart from others in the genre. What the game lacks in verticality, breathtaking vistas, and hidden dungeons around every corner, it makes up for with its solid atmosphere, abundant quality of life features, and a really engaging combat system. And the world with all of its biomes in different regions are populated with unique enemies, mini bosses, ox carts for you to plunder which are new in 1.0, and dozens of points of interest like cemeteries or outposts. And all of these locations give the combat system a chance to flourish. Starting out, you'll only have a basic 3 hit combo with any weapon that you can swing, but when you start upgrading that weapon to a higher rarity, you'll begin unlocking new attacks for it. At the copper level, I unlocked this 360 degree spin for my sword, and instead of just the basic swing for my mace, now I get to do this jump and slam move with it. 
At the iron level, you'll get a second special weapon attack, which could be sending a wave of magic out, or an extra wide swing, or an extra powerful crossbow shot, and this goes for all weapons. The game features a pretty diverse armory, including stuff like greatswords, spears, dual pistols, dual axes, and with the new 1.0 update, now we have bows and whips. Once you reach the legendary tier, you can now use the brand new forge that was just added called the Ancestral Forge, which lets you get really in-depth with your upgrades. There's also Apex Legendary Weapons, which are way above my pay grade right now, but they're supposedly very unique weapons tailored to a specific playstyle. These weapon abilities have great synergy with your Vampiric abilities, which come in six different shades of magic. Each of these schools of magic focuses on their own element. Some share very similar abilities, but they do have completely unique ultimate skills. Some are more offensive and some are more defensive or support related, and I like the way some of them have multiple layers to them. One example of this is the Ward of the Damned ability, where you spawn a shield in front of you and absorbing damage with it summons a skeleton that will fight alongside you. Each consecutive hit that you block also has a 50% chance to spawn an additional skeleton, up to 5 total. Blocking knocks enemies backwards, and if you recast this during its effect, you can launch a wave of energy, causing 25% magic damage and inflicting the Condemn buff. These abilities can also be further customized through the use of jewels. If you secure a jewel that matches any abilities that you've unlocked, you can then slot those jewels into the ability for an additional layer of utility. For example, the Spectral Wolf ability, which when I send it out, it'll ricochet off enemies inflicting magic damage and inflicting weaken. I then added a jewel to it, which makes it return to me, and upon this return, it'll actually heal me. And these jewels are randomly rolled, so you can get multiple drops of these with different benefits. There's also armor that you can craft which provides its own set of stats and can be upgraded to improve those stats and your overall gear score. I haven't gotten any of the real cool armor in the game yet, and with 1.0 they've added 10 new armor sets that look pretty hot. But even with the basic stuff I have, you're able to dye it different colors with the shader system and hide any armor while wearing it. So with all this freedom to customize your playstyle, it makes sense that the boss fights in V Rising are going to challenge your skills. While adjusting your gear level is important, the game sort of demands some self-improvement in the form of learning the boss's attack patterns, learning how to manage your abilities, and if you're playing with friends, figuring out the best playstyles for everyone. It requires a mastery of your toolkit to better adapt to tougher enemies and bosses, which at the end of the day, I found it keeps you more engaged. In Act 1 alone, there are 14 bosses, and throughout the other acts of the game, there are plenty plenty more, and defeating these bosses is how you're going to acquire a lot of new skills, weapons, machines, castle parts, new powers, etc. So your progression becomes working your way along this chain of bosses. But the game doesn't force you to kill every single one of them, and most of them you can do out of order, even if you're underleveled and accidentally stumble upon them. This really clicked for me. Oftentimes, I struggle to stick with survival games because the progression is all about exploring, then building the most efficient resource farms possible, and just trying not to end up in harm's way too much. On the other hand, this game's like, yeah, we know you like upgrading your weapons and building a cool base, but anytime you get bored of that, you can just go hunt down these bosses and be guaranteed some really useful shit for killing them. It helps that the bosses are well designed and don't just stand there doing some basic attacks like robots. Some of them have AoE attacks while others can grab you and pull you across the map. Some bosses might cast spells at you while others summon magic creatures to overwhelm you. And as you get farther into the game, you'll find that bosses can have multiple phases where they change up their movesets and introduce new attacks. Where other survival games have hunger and thirst, V Rising has blood. Over time, your blood drains, and if it becomes empty, you start losing health. To regain more blood, you'll have to damage enemies or animals until they're weak enough to feed on. There are three main parts to this blood system. Those are the amount of blood you have, the quality of the blood, and the blood type. The amount left in your blood pool determines how much you can heal yourself with the blood mend ability, since it drains your blood pool upon use. Blood type determines which buffs you'll have access to, and those change by feeding on different enemy types. Feeding on a bear is going to give you a different set of buffs than if you were to feed on one of Dracula's soldiers. And then the quality determines how many of those buffs become active after you consume their blood. This is represented by the percentage that appears when an enemy's health is low enough. If you feed on an enemy that only has like 20% blood quality, you're not going to activate nearly as many of your buffs as when you feed on an enemy that has like 98% blood. 
While the blood type is associated with specific enemies, the blood quality has an element of randomness to it, and this creates an unexpected but admittedly kind of addictive little minigame of trying to get high quality blood. If you ever want to share your blood type with a friend, you can use the power called Expose Vein to let them feed on you. This cuts your blood pool in half, but gives your friend the same set of buffs. Pretty cool, but kind of kinky. Other powers include changing into different forms like a wolf to increase your travel speed, changing into a bear to knock down outpost doors, or using the dominate human power to mind control humans, bring them back to your base, and convert them into loyal servants who have their own set of perks that will benefit you. In the 1.0 update, there's also a new spider form which lets you bury under the ground to hide from enemies and the sun. When it comes to base building, in 1.0 it is now more flexible than ever with the ability to build multiple floors, gardens, new crafting stations, and new decor, much of which was added during the Gloomrot update. Unlike some other survival games, you don't have unlimited freedom to build wherever you want or place pieces at any angle, you're working with a very controlled system. That's not to say that you can't build impressive and complex bases, and there is a fair amount of customization that can be applied to your castle. And there's also a bit of strategy to building your base. If you make an enclosed room and match the floor in it to the machinery that's in the room, it'll activate buffs on that machinery that make your crafting and refining more efficient. Overall, it scratches that itch to customize and organize your own base, and it more than fulfills your vampire fantasy lifestyle. I also think there's a really underrated feature here, which is the ability to just pick up and move any chest full of items or any currently running machinery, and place it down somewhere else without ever needing to remove the items. Everything just stays in its place, and the machinery instantly resumes running when it's put down. It makes rearranging your room super quick and painless. I've already mentioned a lot of stuff that was added in the new 1.0 release, but I also wanted to shout out some of the smaller stuff that's made its way into the game, such as gamepad support, achievements, lighting engine improvements, UI improvements for item management. Oh, and they just casually added Castlevania's Simon Belmont to the game, so now you can just go fight him as a boss. They've also added this new endgame area that I am nowhere near ready for called Ruins of Mordium, where dynamic events can happen when you're battling against Dracula's army. So lots of cool stuff to look forward to if you've been out of the game for a while, and from what I've played of it so far, it's all very, very polished. So that is your breakdown on V-Rising. Go check out the game on Steam. It is one of the best survival games out there right now. Keep an eye out for the PS5 version releasing later this year, and thank you Stunlock for giving me the opportunity to check this game out.